uh, Papa Spokes. That's going to bring an end to the ring respect portion of this show. But again, we promised you guys we're going double feature on Thursday night. So if you're like us, you might be a little bit up there in age. Sometimes you need to take a potty break halfway through. So you got to go take, you know, a misty little uh, spray. Just go do that. We're going to give you two minutes, a little bit of a fusion net intro heading your way. We're coming right back with our first ever episode of MLW Fusion right here on the Video Bros Network. to the very first edition of MLW Fusion, our fusion, uh, MLW Fusion review show here on the Video Bros Network. You got used to seeing us on Thursday nights doing these MLW reviews. And yes, I'm going to go to the comment section right now. Carl, kick ass doing you bet. That one actually is from, uh, uh, I'm missing the dude's name right now. I think it's Peter Aya, something like that. Uh, a good friend of the guys in on lap. He's done some wonderful work with them as well, too. That is one of his kick ass tracks. And then uh, going over here. Not gonna lie, I'm high right now. I thought my TV was on fire from the heat. Y'all are bringing tight, yeah, brother. You know what? <laughs> I might have thought that too because guess what? I'm up there with you right about now. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we got. Oh, hey, look who's in the house, wrestling rodeo, folk. Thank you, my man, for joining us here tonight. Good to see you out here. MLW Fusion is still not happening yet, Papa Smokes. They're still on a little bit of a sabbatical, and you know, over on the other program, we've been doing a little bit of a retroactive look. And hey. We weren't going to leave you guys in the dust on a Thursday night because what else are you going to be doing on Thursday? You're going to go watch television? Nah. No, there's nothing good on TV. Other Twitch channels? Nah, there's nothing good on other Twitch channels. That's why you're right here partying with the video bros. We're having a hell of a time. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, staying tuned in, and having a good time. Papa Smokes, MLW Fusion Episode 101. This is one that I wanted to check out. This one had a big main event attached to it, a match between Filthy Tom Waller and Killer Cross that we are going to get to in a short bit here. But damn, this whole episode of MLW Fusion in general, this was a wrestling show, if I ever saw one. Yeah, good good pick, man. And there, there's lots of strong episodes of Fusion that we probably haven't seen, but this was a good, fairly recent one to go to that uh, I hadn't watched before and a uh, really good episode. Let's get into this. 
Yeah, we sure will. So we started things off with a little bit of a recap from Fatu taking on Shima from the previous week on episode 100 of MLW Fusion. The champ absolutely denying the legend Shima and then putting him in the body bag and taking him out on the stretcher. What a scene of complete destruction the Contra has continued to be on ever since their introduction to MLW. Yeah, and this is like, we have to remember that we saw the, the uh, faction known as Contra for a couple of years ruling and running over uh, MLW, but this is the, <clears throat> pardon me, this is the early days of that. This is uh, the first time they put someone in the body bag and had the Sentai Death Squad uh, carry them out on the stretcher. Very uh, foreboding and uh, and uh, scary kind of thing to watch for uh, opponents of Jacob Fatu and, and Contra units. So uh, excellent psychological tactics uh, in use there by Joseph Samuel Fatu and the boys. Yeah, man, it was it was something to recap. I, I think we almost need to go back and watch that episode. So one of these night tier Papa Smokes. But in the meantime, and in between time, as a famous commentator once said, uh, we got down to the action inside the ring. First of all, we had the Laredo Kid coming out, uh, being joined by Conan. And he was going to be taking on Myron Reed. They recapped the Laredo Kid had recently got a pinfall victory over the middleweight champion Myron Reed. And that it wasn't for the middleweight championship at the time. So... Here tonight, he's getting that opportunity to go one-on-one -on -one with the champ for the title. And this one had a little bit of personal animosity behind it. They did show a video package of backstage Conan giving an interview and then Injustice interrupting Injustice considering, yeah, considering, consisting, mind you, of Myron Reed, the young goat, Jordan Oliver, and Cotto Brazil at the time. They interrupt Conan. They have some choice words going back and forth. And this one just about came to blows. Yeah, and isn't Conan a good promo guy? Hey, like oh, yeah. he he, oh, he yeah. always he always pulls out something real good. And the the young guys in in Injustice were kind of like mocking him and giving him some trash talk and stuff, but you could see it wasn't affecting Conan and and he had choice words in reply for those guys. So setting up this match where we've already got a little bit of heat, the Laredo kid has a non-title win over Myron Reed. Myron Reed himself a competitor he's he's not the chicken shit kind of heel where he's always running from you he wants the match he wants to beat you uh fair and square one-on-one -on -one if he can so uh d despite that this is the time where uh uh myron reed's wearing the chest protector so that nobody's chops work on his chest and a few other uh tricks up his sleeve this is at a time where he was more a rule breaker than we've seen him lately yeah, and you know what? That was one of the notes I wrote down too because there was outside the ring where the Laredo kid was doing the double chops to Myron's chest and he was fake selling the, the move. He's holding the chest, holding the chest. And when Laredo kid clued in, he's like, no, nah, no, you SOB, you aren't, you aren't actually hurt. So he goes, Myron challenges him to do it a third time and Laredo kid goes, okay. And it bang, right across the face. He makes, he makes yeah. Myron eat, read, eat a slap sandwich. It was absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. And these two guys, I mean, we've admired the work of the Laredo kid before when there was a big influx of lucha wrestlers that came into MLW uh, over the past two years. Um, there was all kinds of uh, special talents. As, speaking of special talents. Here's, <laughs> we got Bing joining us. <laughs> yeah, he just ate and now he wants in on the podcast. But at any rate, we, we like to the Laredo kid, as well as some of the other outstanding Lucha talents we borrowed from AAA, such as uh, Taurus and uh, and Penta, and I like uh, Octagon Junior a yeah. whole bunch too, but uh, uh, Laredo kid, this guy's got all the tools that it takes to uh, to be one of the top Lucha wrestlers, but we've also seen him with appearances on AEW and a couple other uh, major companies as well, so uh, um, this guy's can go anywhere and, uh, I, I could see him following in the footsteps of Ray Phoenix and Penta and getting signed with a big company. Now, if only the picture of the cat that Carl just posted was a little gray, I think it would be absolutely perfect because yeah. Bing, Bing's attitude makes him that damn cool right there. He is one cool cat. Uh, so, <laughs> but yeah, you know, Laredo Kid is really over the time. Like the more I watch him, the more I really respect and like his work. It's clean. It's good. It's strong. He takes himself seriously and he takes his matches seriously and he gives you wrestling in there. He can do high flying and stuff like that, but there's logic and reason behind what he's connecting and putting together. And I really am enjoying his style. Um, 
But, you know, as it goes, he's out there. He's got Conan in his corner. But unfortunately, you've got both Coda Brazil and Jordan Oliver who are not afraid to get involved in this one and really kind of make those distractions happen, proving that injustice in numbers can be a real handful. Yeah, and this didn't throw off Laredo Kid. He took uh, matters into his own hands and started knocking the Injustice guys off the apron. Then he gave them both uh, flying suicide dives to the outside and basically took them out of uh, out of contention in this match. The only uh, the only drawback with doing something like that is that you might goad those uh, outside wrestlers into action into re- retaliating and uh they they weren't going to keep their noses clean while myron's in the ring with a title match that's for sure yeah you know and then but that all led to that whole move where myron does that ace crusher over the top ropes to the later cool. Laredo kid right to the concrete i was like damn i was like i hope they're both alive after that move that was sick looking yeah yeah that was an insane bump well they hit the apron first and then the floor don't think the apron's all that much softer than the floor not much and then uh yeah yeah that that was a really good spot and really death defying um on another note i wanted to bring up this one sequence because people sometimes wonder about psychology and uh and the way of laying out matches and stuff and and wonder why some people don't like it there was one sequence in here where reed gave the laredo kid a stunner then he jumped up on the second rope, bounced back, and gave him a flying cutter off the ropes, which looked awesome and was a completely huge bump. Then he got up and gave Laredo Kid a nice super kick to the side of the face, which also looked really stiff and looked really real. So now Reed has he's done three big moves on Laredo Kid in the, in the, the past couple seconds. He springs to the top rope faster than I've ever seen anybody get up on the top rope. He just grabbed the ropes and flung himself up with his feet, and he was going to do another move off the top rope. Laredo Kid already got up and was climbing up after him. By the time this oh, this yeah. kind of t- takes a little bit of a, a little bit of it away for me, yeah. because that trio of moves by Reed, as a viewer, you're looking at this and saying, "Ooh." Ooh, ooh, three times in a row, three hard moves. That's got to keep that guy down just for a little bit, right? Then when he mounted the ropes, when Reed mounted the ropes so quickly, I thought, this is a really nice sequence. I like this. But as fast as he did that, and trust me, it was quick as a hiccup, as fast as he did that, uh, uh, Laredo Kid was right up there. And then they did that, the spot that was... uh, kind of like a German suplex, but a Spanish fly where they both went over, which was, again, a really nice spot and a big old bump and everything, but I just didn't like how they got there. This is, I'm not trying to uh, crap on this match. It was a good match, Mm -hmm. and I like both these guys, and I know that they know how to lay out a match and all that. This is just one of the little things I like to bring up every now and again so that people understand why other people don't like certain matches or certain sequences and stuff. There are just some things that de- defy the believability of wrestling. Even though we all know what's going on with wrestling, it just it makes it look a little bit phony when that happens. And uh, I, I think wrestlers, when they lay out their matches, should watch out for things like that. Yeah, and you're 100 percent there, Papa Smokes. I, I noticed that as well too. Again, it it does irk me as well. But again, it, it as we've always said, it's one of those split and hair things where it's like if you're gonna take one thing away from it, Laredo Kid, I don't think they should have had him pop up so quick. I think that the other big bump could have come, you know, a minute later, something like that. They could have done something to lead up to it. Uh, they didn't have to rush rush it like they did. Uh, but other than that, again, this match was put together well. From start yeah. to finish, uh, yeah. those distractions proved to be a big, big thing. The uh, ace crusher to the outside, Myron Reed, then the springboard off the top rope, and he retains that middleweight championship. And for those who haven't followed MLW before, uh, this was the first run of Myron Reed as the MLW uh, cru- uh, middleweight champion, mind you. And he is now the three-time MLW middleweight champion as we currently speak going into the new season and the only wrestler in the history of major league wrestling to hold any of the championships on more than one occasion. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he, he had lost it to Leo rush at one point, won it back from him and then lost it to Ch- Tajiri 
and won it back from him as well. So not uh, getting lost in the shuffle, he wins his rematches. Yeah, he sure does. He makes it count, and he made his match count tonight. Um, after this match was over, we went to a edition of the Lifestyles of the Rich and Dynastic. <laughs> so this is like in a coffee shop or a setting. I'm assuming it's got to be a coffee shop. I mean, we're talking Richard Holiday here. But now the Dynasty doesn't quite look the same as they once did. When we last talked about these guys, this trio consisted of Richard Holiday, Alexander Hammerstone, and one Maxwell Jacob Friedman. But I think that he might have been a little bit busy at the time. So they brought in this this young this young chap. Uh, I believe his name might be Gino Medina. I think we've talked about him a few times, Papa Spokes. Man, Gino looked out of place here a little bit. Um, and I think it's just, I know what they were trying to do. They wanted to build him into something because there's a lot of potential Gino Medina. Like we've said, he's a good looking kid. He gets it inside the ring. He's very capable. Um, but speaking wise, there's work to be done, especially at this point. He was not ready for speaking on a camera on the level that, say, an Alexander Hammerstone or Richard Holiday were. And in what's probably his second language as well, too, let's not forget some of these young guys. Uh, have, you know, he's probably spoke Spanish for most of his life. And, uh, you know, th there's just not that same feeling of uh, of comfortability when when you're speaking in uh, your second tongue not your mother tongue kind of thing so he, he, it's a difficult thing uh, i i also get what they were going for it, it, it's a good fit in a way because medina's a slick handsome looking guy he's an arrogant heel he's kind of one of those guys that likes to look like he's rich and all that stuff it, it, he does fit in the dynasty in a way but mm -hmm. It's a tough sell with the other guys in there, and, and he kind of looked like the third wheel sort of thing. And especially taking over for somebody the level of an MJF as well, too. Yeah, Gino just wasn't quite on that level. And take nothing away. I'm not saying he never will be on that level. He has all the potential to be at that level. He just wasn't quite at that level yet. But he was going to be going one-on-one -on -one with Mance Warner on this program. Uh, this match was being set up. Uh, Gino Medina is undefeated, and Mance Warner has been getting under the skin of the dynasty. They did not want him anywhere near them. They wanted to... What was it? They were working on having him removed from MLW. Richard Holiday's lawyer slash father was working on the paperwork to make sure that Matt Warner was gone so that he couldn't get his grubby fingernails, as they put it, on the dynasty. Yeah, and fair enough. I mean, Richard Holiday, if he if he wants anything, it's not to have the hands of a drunken redneck with his dirty fingernails all over his uh, rarefied air. So, um, yeah, just another way to get some heat going for this match. Mance Warner uh, was a pretty big babyface style wrestler. I say babyface style because he didn't, he wasn't uh, a guy, kind of guy that uh, obeyed the rules or anything like that. He had his death matches and, and other stuff like that, but he was uh, one of those. Uh, uh, He's kind of like a heel that you like to cheer type thing. So, but he's on the side of the baby faces in this, and uh, he's looking for a win over Gino Medina. This will uh, uh, prop up his stats a little bit towards possibly a title match or something. Yeah, you bet. So we get down to the match, Gino Medino versus Mance Warner. And again, one thing I got to say, Mance Warner looks like an absolute psychopath. They call him the psych Southern psychopath, and he looks like a psychopath. Those eyes on that dude. I mean, if looks could kill, Mance Warner would be the champion everywhere he goes. Yeah, and he does okay being a Southern psychopath for a guy that's from Seattle. But uh, <laughs> hey, man, you, you got to make a gimmick. You got to find something somewhere. He takes it and runs and uh, does a good thing with it. Yeah, and Gino tried to hot, hot, ah, hot start the matchup. He jumped right into it, trying to go on the attack on Mance Warner, which worked for quite some time, actually. He took good control for the first portion of the match until they rolled to the outside, which is when Mance kind of took over from there. Uh, this had some good back and forth between these two, actually. There was some good wrestling inside that ring. I liked what I saw. Again, I, I felt like this wasn't quite as good as match number one, but it still broke up the, the card altogether for this episode of MLW Fusion and gave us still a very serviceable, good, solid matchup between these two gentlemen. Yeah, it was pretty okay. Nothing uh, blew me away about this match or anything like that. I think it was meant to elevate Medina without uh, without weakening the, the look of Mance, and, and the finish kind of uh, suggests that was the case as well. 
Um, it, it didn't seem to me like they had a whole ton of chemistry. Maybe it was the first time they were wrestling each other. That's possible as well. But um, I think this match did pretty good showing that Medina could hang with Mance Warner, who's kind of a top of the card type guy, maybe not main events all the time, but definitely towards the top of the card. So as we've known ever since we've been doing these reviews, you know that Court Bauer and MLW see something in Gino Medina the same way that we do. There's lots of uh, raw tools that could be uh, that could be shaped into something uh, good, and I think that process is ongoing. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, happening fast enough for uh, Court Bauer's liking or not, but uh, this shows that they were putting some thought and some money and effort into Gino Medina. I hope that continues. The, really, the last we saw of him, he was kind of slogging away in those uh, six-man tag team matches against Microman and all that. So maybe that same level of push isn't there, but I wouldn't give up on Gino Medina yet. I, th I also think there's something there with this guy. Yeah, and he's still very incredibly young at this time, too. So a lot of time on his hands. Uh, that is definitely in his favor. And as you said, a bit of a dusty finish. Uh, Gino Medina originally going to try to pull the tights of Mance Warner or the jeans, whatever you want to call them. And it didn't quite work out as uh, Mance Warner continued to roll up Gino Medina and then use the same move on him, rolling up the tights, one, two, three, and handing Gino Medina his first loss. And a lot of frustration coming out of the dynasty after, after this one. Yeah, but again, they, they give Warner the win, but even the, as a baby face, he has to cheat to win. So again, point goes to Medina a little bit in that this top of the card uh, baby face has to cheat to beat the, the heel, and uh, you don't see that all that often. So again, it just speaks to uh, how highly they thought of Medina. They didn't want, want him to look bad in eating a loss. Yeah, exactly. So this one played out... Nicely, it did exactly what it needed to do. So I had no problem with this match. I thought it was pretty good. It had its right place on the card. Uh, from there, we went to a video package. It was the Von Erics with their uh, father, Kevin Von Erich. Uh, they were talking about a recent uh, a recent squabble they've got going against Team Filthy. So this would have been after Filthy Tom Lawler turned on the Von Erics and also brought in Team Filthy. Dominic Carini, and what is the other gentleman's name in the, in the group there? Um he was the guy that they were pretending was uh, Rip Von Eric. Like they were yeah, okay, made... Kid Osborne, but there was another one yes. part of Team Healthy as well, too. Eric, oh, Kevin Koo eventually was there, but he wasn't there on this show. Yeah, but they had somebody else uh, there on this particular card, too. Is Eric somebody that was oh, uh, Eric part of Stevens? The... Yeah, there yeah. we go. Yeah, yeah. Right, so that's uh, right. who was part of Team Filthy at the time uh, prior to Kevin Koo coming in and before Tom Lawler eventually leaving MLW. But, uh, yeah, this is a good talk uh, between uh, the boys and their father. Of course, Marshall, you can really see that Marshall when it comes to being on camera and talking. He's the he's the revved up one. He's the he's the really kick-ass, when you get in there and start fighting type guy. Ross a little bit more level-headed, a little bit more laid back, but, man, it's great. Oh, it's okay, Astrid. You can be late. You can be anytime. You, but as long as you're here, we're happy to see you, Astrid. Thanks for joining in, as always. Uh, you missed it earlier in the night, but there you go. You get a second one from the video, bros, because it's a double feature here on Thursday night, and we are sailing this ship straight to the moon. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, you know, where the hell was I? I'm talking about the Von Erics again. Uh, let's go back to that, Pop Smokes. Uh, so these boys, um, they, Marshall cuts a hell of a promo. I really like when this guy starts talking. I believe he's going to go kick somebody's ass. And yeah, I, I agree with that a hundred percent. I also think the same thing of Kevin. I like it when he's on and I like it when they let him talk. He plays the part of the kind of uh, older mentor, the teacher, the father figure so well and uh, giving them advice and uh, telling uh, them stories of his life when he was a wrestler and how things used to be and, how the guys have to, the boys have to take the lessons from that and, and find their own way in the wrestling biz. I like those promos with the boys and their dad. They, they ring true and, and it's a, just another sense of uh, nostalgia and wrestling history when you watch a brand new show, hearkening back to the, the days of the foundational days that, that uh, made this stuff that we watch now. Yeah. 
and I got to go to this one for a minute. Uh, just so you know, those Astro emotes should be available on all channels as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Make them available, damn it. Um, so from there, Papa folks, we're going to go to the PWI list. And no, we're not talking about the PWI 500 that you've all been wanting to see on everybody else's shows. No, we're <laughs> talking about the PWI Top 10 Contenders for the MLW World Heavyweight Championship of as of this writing. So the PWI does this from time to time uh, on MLW. They'll put out a top 10 list. This is the people who are considered in contention for an opportunity to fight the champion. And we're going to go through this list, uh, right through the whole list, and maybe just talk about it briefly afterwards. Number 10, we had King Mo, who would have been just recently joining MLW at the time, the former MMA fighter joining the joining the list. Uh, number nine, Low Key, the former MLW champion and an MLW mainstay one of the originals from the company number eight Matt warner who picked up a victory earlier in the night surprisingly number seven mjf and considering that he would have been part of aew at the time i think they had some pretty big hopes that he was still going to be able to do some work over on the mlw side of things uh number six not surprisingly richard holiday who was starting to really look and be pushed like a star at this point uh Brian Pillman Jr., number five. We're going to talk about more about that young man here in a little bit on this program as well, too. Number four, we got Filthy Tom Lawler, the former MLW World Heavyweight Champion. Uh, then you got Davey Boy Smith Jr. in that mix up there. Number three. Number two, surprisingly, the young Goat Myron Reed. And not surprisingly because of his skill or anything, but when we got to the restart, which is not far after this point in time, I believe that Myron Reed was a lot lower on that list, it, surprisingly at number two here, to drop down to maybe I think it was like five, six, I think around the time of the restart, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I imagine that's one of those things. I think the wrestling magazines, with their ratings, if there was more than one belt in the company, you might get those top rankings, i.e. there would be a champion, then the number one would be, say, the in this case, the national open weight champion, the number two would be the middleweight champion. And then the rest of the contenders would go on after that. I kind of had the figure, the feeling that's what they were doing here. But um, I'm trying to remember if they did it at some of the other times when we did that same list, because I think always it was fought two champion and then Hammerstone, Hammerstone number one, because he was the national open weight champion. Same thing with the, uh, the dub or something they would have like the champion and then the number one guy would be the intercontinental champion and then the other contenders would come after that but maybe that's what they're doing Hoff smokes don't be silly you know the other companies don't do stuff like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, but yes, as you mentioned, Alexander Hammerstone did uh, round out this list at number one, the national open weight champion undefeated in all this time working with that title and then the champion Jacob fought too undefeated, on a path of destruction. Nobody wants to get in his way, but they do want that championship. And there's 10 names right there that could be vying for it. We do know eventually who would get that opportunity and make one of the biggest matches of the restart in MLW. Uh, you can go catch that on previous episodes of Ring Respect Radio because we did review that one as it happened uh, when Hammerstone did eventually fight Jacob Fought too. Uh, but we did say we'd talk about Brian Pillman Jr. here a little bit more because after this, this is when he was given the PWI's Rookie of the Year Award for 2019. This was the second year in a row that he won it. We Again, we've seen so much growth from Brian Pillman Jr. as it's gone along. Um, he, he's getting better as he goes. And this is just proof that people had belief in what he was doing. And I strongly believe Brian Pillman Jr. loves and respects wrestling enough that he wants to be one of the best out there. Yeah, well, being Rookie of the Year two years in a row, that's pretty impressive. Uh, I don't know how that works, how you can be a rookie in your second year, but Hey, it's the wild and wacky world of wrestling. I've seen much stranger things happen, but at any rate, uh, yeah, they obviously see something in Pillman as well, and uh, he, he's got uh, a famous last name to work off of, including his famous father, and uh, he's a good-looking athlete. He looks like his dad. He's embracing the gimmick. He's got the cool mullets and all that stuff kind of working on his body. He's, he's nothing much to speak of here, but he has gotten better over the over the past couple of years, looking more like a wrestler. And uh, yeah, his days in MLW, he's extremely green, and it, that's obvious by his promos and his ring work. But again, he's enthusiastic. Um, he's, he's showing up to all this stuff, and he's willing to uh, 
to be in, in a faction, the Hart Foundation of the kind of second and third generation uh, Hart family and Pillman family. And uh, obviously the, co the company sees some potential in him because they're giving him a push here. And it's, it's almost looking like that push is a little too early for him, but um, whatever he, he he's obviously going to take this uh, attention and run with it. And he's another guy that gets a big job out of some exposure on MLW going to the, uh, the billionaire sons company there. And uh, he's probably been making good money ever since and wrestling once every two months. And that's about it. You know, I think he's actually seen quite a bit more than what some people are. And, you know, he's, he's become so confident that when you do see him even over in AEW and everything, you can tell that confidence continues to rise and that they're on the verge of something special with Brian Pillman Jr. So I hope nothing but the best for him because, you know, I know that he respects the sport and I know that he believes in it. So I respect him at the same time. Um, from there, speaking of Br Pillman Jr., he was the subject of a promo. He was a promo done by the members of Injustice talking about Pillman Jr. and him wanting to challenge for Myron Reed's middleweight championship saying, come get it. Like, just come get it if you want it. Uh, they also had some uh, words for Conan and also for the Laredo kid who had lost earlier in the night. Uh, this was kind of that style of promo that we became very used to after the restart from Injustice, the black and white, kind of out in the streets, looking, you know, looking like guys just hanging out on the corner or whatever and not afraid to let you know exactly what they're thinking. Yeah, and I thought Injustice was a pretty effective faction for the time it was in. The guys in it were pretty good and pretty uh, uh, con convincing in their portrayal of it. Um, I, I thought this was good. The, the, they just seemed like some kids that you would kind of be scared of to walk by down the street late at night, and they're going to talk some trash to you. And I think Myron Reed is clearly the, uh, the standout talent in this group. And that's kind of obvious by his ring work and his mic work. But this was another situation where he stood up and said, hey, I'm not going to run from anybody. I want to keep this title, but I want matches in the ring and I want good opponents because I want big wins. And, and it's that fearlessness and that confidence where you can kind of see that Myron Reed is he's not happy staying where he is. He's going to push forward, reach higher and get better all the time and God, we've seen him just improve tenfold over the last couple of years since we've been reviewing this show. Yeah, and I caught one of his matches uh, on a different on uh, Battle Slam this summer as well too. And I mean, he just continues to grow. I am so excited for the new season to see where Myron Reed's at now that he's in the Boomaye Fight Club. I think that is going to be so kick ass. Him, Alex Kane, Mister Thomas, and who knows where it goes? It might uh, add more members in the new new season for all we know. Anything could happen when MLW comes back. Yeah, and uh, there's talk that they should uh, add a female to their group as well, and I think oh, yeah. that's a good idea, especially if they finally get the featherweights division going uh, to get uh, uh, some kind of a good lady wrestler that uh, does the suplex and Olympic style and strength style uh, wrestling. It would be absolutely deadly. Yeah, they got they. There's got tons of them out there. They got to bring them in. Uh, Taya Valkyrie needs some strong competition for her belt. We know that she's got a mystery opponent this coming Sunday. So who knows who might show up at the tapings this Sunday? Again, if you're going to the tapings or happen to read results, no spoilers, please. We don't want to know. We already know about the national situation with the national openweight championship because they made that no secret. Still going to love the match either way. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to know. So if you guys happen to ever know, don't let us know. We'll We'll get to it. We come to you every Thursday with what's up to speed when it comes to MLW. Uh, moving on from there, we had a backstage promo team, Filthy, are a little bit shooken up last week. I believe uh, that it was Eric, the other, other member there, that had taken a loss to Davey Boy Smith Jr. They were trying to get their heads back in the game. That's when Lawler cut in with his promo on Killer Cross, getting ready for that main event. Man, this was just exactly what it needed to be, especially when Tom Lawler got to talk and he just was ready to fight. He laid it out. This is what I'm going to do to you, Cross. Let's go. Time for some ass kicking. Yeah, and there's something about Tom Lawler that's very convincing and very real, too. And you can see that this is a guy that's improved vastly on the mic since he turned to the professional wrestling side of things. Um, I've heard some of his earlier promos, and it's just a little more primitive, a little more... Uh, uh, convoluted sort of thing but he he gets the hang of it and uh by this time 
in this promo, he's looking like a natural and uh, he speaks very well. He speaks very clearly and, uh, and uh, he's got this part of the, uh, of pro wrestling down pat, I think. And uh, it, it just only uh, helps to lead into a, what's a big heavyweight or uh, not heavyweight title match, but a big heavyweight contenders bout here uh, in the main event. Yeah, and this one was going to be awesome. I can't wait to talk about it. It's coming up. But before we yeah, did someone say natural, we sure did. Papa Spokes did, in fact, Asher, the natural Astro Pizarro, getting the name drop in the show here tonight. Uh, but before we get to that big one-on-one, -on -one big guy fight that we got coming up here, Papa Spokes, one more time, we went backstage. The Dynasty, they are very upset about the cheating that Vance Warner did, saying – Gino's not to blame. Gino did not lose the match. He's not the one that cheated in this thing. It was Mance that cheated. That's the only way the guy could pick up a victory. And the only frustration they have at this moment is with Mance Warner and not with Gino Medina. You know, the guys pulling together and showing uh, signs of solidarity, even though uh, you could kind of see that uh, they weren't completely comfortable with Medina right off the bat. At least they show him. <clears throat> this little bit of solidarity in this match and sticking with their guy. Yeah, you bet. So from there, it's time, Papa Smokes. It's that time of the night, as always. Wait for it. Wait for it. It's time for the main event of the evening. This match scheduled for one fall. One fall. All right, there we go. Woo, we're I'll be the crowd. Yeah, You got it. All right, yeah. Warming up those pipes. Get them all nice and Nice and loose here on a Thursday night. And again, man, that audience retention. You guys are making me love this night. Thank you so much for making this debut a memorable night for us. This is probably the most exciting time I have had in my six years of doing stuff like this. God damn, this is awesome. I had never got Bro, what a great! Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, I've been, I really have been putting in the practice. I have been spending time actually paying attention to different, uh, different. Uh, commentators different announcers over the years uh paying attention to videos that they do whether it be boxing mma uh wrestling every sort of which one so i have been trying to put in the work to get the vocals to match that kind of style because i really i have that aspiration one time if one time only papa smokes i want to be able to be a ring announcer for just one night just one night i could see that i hope you get the chance i think you'll hit a home run munson I really do too. And again, if not, I'm still very happy to spend Thursday nights with all of you guys. And again, hey, guess what, Pop Smokes? I got some cool news before we talk about the main event itself. I ain't done for the week. There's more coming up. I got more shit going on. And guess what? It's going to be on Sunday. So Sunday, you can join on Chris Parrish's uh, Twitch account as myself and Chris Parrish. And I'm sure there will be other places you'll be able to find the show but we're going to be bringing you the very first edition of Bustin' Out because brunching makes us feel good. It is going to be a kick-ass time with my brunch buster brother, Chris Parrish, on Sunday. So make sure you check that show out. It is going to be just awesome. Thursday nights, we're going to be doing this shit. We got Parrish and Astrid doing th Tuesday nights. T Carl and Joe doing Tuesday nights. All my favorite people are out there. And we have more of my favorite people that are going to be coming out doing more stuff here very, very soon. And I can't wait. I am going to be watching all the shows, making sure we send everybody to the top because that's where you all belong. And uh, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday with the Brunch Busters. You got that right, Carl. Uh, it is going to be a hell of a time. But right now, you're with the video bros. It is Thursday night, and we got a main event to break down here for you. When it was Filthy Tom Lawler taking on Killer Cross, and we're talking about the Filthy Tom Lawler. That is a heel now. And yes, Astrid, oh, hey, get the V out, as they like to say. <laughs> so, um, This match, though, Bob Spokes, I mean, this... This was a slugfest at times. Like, man, Killer Cross did not hold back when he was laying it into Tom Lawler and vice versa. I mean, this thing really started off with Cross showing just how strong he lays his damn strikes in, really taking it to the former champion, Filthy Tom Lawler, before Filthy Tom could come back and show what he does best. And that's the grappling, the reversals, the holds. And there was a whole lot of it. This, this was packed full of stuff I like. Yeah, this was a pretty solid match, and there was really nothing fancy about it whatsoever. I think a lot of the uh, the uh, star power of this match was done in the entrances. 
-hmm. and with the uh, the grapplers that were you know booked in this match, Tom Lawler comes out. He's a name. He's already established from the world of mixed martial arts and the UFC. People know him. People accept him as a threat and a real wrestler and such. Killer Cross comes out, and he's he's another story altogether. He's just so convincing as a huge, mean, psycho-looking guy. Um, he's a he's a spectacle when he comes to the ring with that music and the way he interacts with the fans, just even with his eyes alone, the way he stares and smiles and just the facial expressions on him. The guy's a star, man. He's money. And, and you could feel the uh, hairs on your arms and the back of your neck stand up a little bit when a guy comes out with that kind of star power. He's never even really accomplished any huge things in pro wrestling, but he's one of those guys that when he walks into the arena, you know that his opponent's in trouble and you know you're going to see some some violent and wild shit in his match. It's it's exciting, and he's a spectacle all, all unto himself. So typical of these uh, MLW title matches from around this time, they make a big deal of it. There's a long lead-up. This match was only 10 minutes long, but the, 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 lead, the entire package, the entire segment was 22 minutes long with the uh, entrances and all that stuff too. So showing the tail of the tape, having the uh, ring announcer uh, go over various things, including rules and weights and all that sporting stuff. And uh, big, long introductions and entrances really just, it's the kind of like the icing before the cake almost. It gets the fan in the perfect position to say, oh yeah, I'm ready to see these guys have a wild match. This is good. I'm ready. I'm tense. I'm nervous and I want to see this. And and I think the, the big fight feel of MLW title matches does just that, even on the free TV show Fusion. Yeah, and I mean, there's a few things I wrote down here. Again, like uh, Tom was really doing the work on the left arm, I believe, of Killer Cross. In fact, holding in that uh, the guillotine choke at one point even, and Cross then having to at one point stand up with all of his might, holding Tom Lawler the entire time in order to break that hold. But Tom didn't let go so easily. It wasn't just a one and done. Killer Cross really had to fend him off in this thing. And then to speaking about the hairs uh, going up on your back, how about when Killer Cross smiled when Filthy Tom slapped the taste out of his mouth as if he absolutely enjoyed the pain that Tom was bringing? Yeah, and again, that's not that's not a working punch. That was a real hard slap to the face. There's there's no uh, going easy on that one or going light on that one. These guys were doing a spot where that's that's you know call it a strong style spot or whatever you want they were smacking each other's faces pretty good to make it look convincing and wasn't that a good one there's a couple of blasts across the chest but then a couple of good hard slaps to that mandible jaw area and you know how that stings once and i'm sure you've been slapped by a couple of ladies in your time uh, if i know you at all and uh, you know how that what? feels it it smarts right up there where the jaw connects to up by your ear. And uh, that just that evil looking smile is he, he's killer cross just has so much star quality as a wrestler. Uh, he almost doesn't have to do anything. As soon as he gets in there, he's over. You know, I be, just because you brought it up, Bob. So I, I, I will tell people one story and no, it's not <laughs> because I was trying to pick some lady up from a bar or anything like that. That's not, that's not me. Come on. I'm a married man. I've been, been with my wife for th th 13 years you guys come on jeez i'm only 40 it's not like you know, anyway <laughs> so uh back when i was doing uh acting classes uh this was a uh a, an event that we had done uh that we were putting on different uh performances throughout the weekend <laughs> uh evil looky so i thought pop was talking about bobby's grinning for a second <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, so we went to this uh, this thing, and we, there was these acting sessions in between, and one of them was doing improv, which is something I've always enjoyed doing. And one of the improv games at the time was called Beat the Seat. And the idea is that somebody is sitting on a park bench, and the idea is you come into the scene, and your actions are supposed to try to convince them to leave the bench so that you take over the bench. 
And so I came in and it really took no effort at all. I just come in with a little bit of swag or a little bit of a sway. I sat down next to the uh, lady beside me. I gave her the old arm over top and I'm just like, so how's it going? And that's all it took. Slap right across the old face, right across Bobby's face, just like so. And it wasn't theater slapping. That was real slap, and I got the taste slapped right out of my mouth. Everyone was worried for me, but guess what? I'm a tough guy. I can take it. Well, what did you do to make her do that, Munson, is my question. Look at this face. What did I do? You couldn't <laughs> see where your other hand was. <laughs> <laughs> this is too much fun, Papa So, um, but Here's the one. She, she was an unsafe worker. <laughs> <laughs> she sure was. I wasn't expecting it, but okay, uh, you know, at the same time, I did uh, grow up uh, being trained in uh, boxing, and I've also taken, uh, like, wrestling in high school as well, too, so it's not like I was afraid to take a hit and all kind of thing. I was used to it. I wasn't afraid to get hit in the face by any means, and it has happened multiple times throughout my life. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, drinks happen. People get stupid. Yeah, I'm from Manitoba. I'll try and imagine what that's like. <laughs> yeah, well, you're not from Saskatchewan where you can sit at a writer's game and uh, get with all the people that are, you know, a little out of control. Yeah, you, you wear the wrong jersey at one of those games and uh, you're taking your life in your hands. <laughs> you really are. That's why you don't go to those games, even when your uh, boys from Winnipeg are in town. Well, yeah, that, that did happen one time. I won't get into it at this point, but uh, we had, it got a little nutty. That's fair. We wouldn't want to run overtime boring people with football talk on a wrestling program now, would we? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back on track. We're talking I, get, about... <laughs> I get that reference. <laughs> We're going to go back on track, back on the rails. Killer Cross and Filthy Top. The only thing I'll nitpick about this match is the dusty finish. I wanted to see a clean finish of some sorts between these two guys. Uh, unfortunately, that's not what we got. In fact, we got a big old dusty finish here when Team Filthy came out for the attack uh, on Killer Cross. But then the day was saved. The Vaughn Eriks and Davy Boy Smith Jr. come out after that. And from there, uh, they bait the challenge for a 4v4 tag matchup for next week on MLW Fusion. Uh, so it would be the Vaughn Eriks, uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. and Killer Cross taking on Team Filthy. I, I kind of want to go watch one, episode 102 as we speak right now, Pop. So we'll see that yeah. go down. I was curious as did did Killer Cross participate in that match? He's usually uh only in for a shot at a time kind of thing. Yeah, it's hard to say. I don't know about the time he left to head on over to NXT for the very first time. And then, of course, he had his short stint with MLW that we'll probably get to see one more match out of from the Battle Riot tapings coming up in the new season. Uh, but, of course, he's gone on to bigger things. As you said, he presents himself like a star. He is a star, and clearly Triple H sees that in him, and that's why he's presenting him like one over on SmackDown on Friday nights. And, I mean, kudos. I mean, Go, go to the moon, Killer Cross, because you are a damn star. You'll be a champion before long over there, and everybody will see your brilliance there, too. Um, but, yeah, this this was a solid match between two guys. I thought I would have liked to have seen a different finish, but what it did leave me doing is wanting to see the next episode of Fusion. For sure, and uh, that's probably a big part of what this match was about, was to get some heat going between those two factions. It's kind of weird that Davy Boy Smith is not – participating in his own heart foundation faction but in this one but at any rate they needed a big guy to uh, fill out that team and and it's these teams are perfectly logical to me uh team filthy with a, a very weak link in there so uh, with that uh, what was his name kit carson kit, kit osborne kit osborne yeah, yeah yeah i don't know about that guy the, uh, but uh at any rate, uh, we should maybe watch that next one and review it, or uh, or maybe we'll just watch it in our own time. But I'm kind of fascinated by Killer Cross's little appearances in MLW because he makes such a big splash in a smaller company. And I can't wait to see what he throws down inside the Battle Riot 4 once they uh, start airing that one with the new season of uh, Fusion as well, too. I think that's going to be a kick-ass, as well as you're going to be able to see a matchup featuring Scarlett Bardot, who took place in the uh, Battle Riot tapings as well, too. So prior to her going back to the WWE, you got a match in MLW as well, too. So fantastic. That's going to be coming up on the new season of MLW. 
Uh, that I have had so much fun, Papa Smokes. I don't know if it is happening next Thursday or we'll be still be doing the retroactive pieces here for you guys uh, or whether we're going to be starting to talk about the new season of Fusion, but we know it's coming up very, very shortly. We know this Sunday they are doing some new tapings for MLW Fusion Television, so we got to imagine that that season is going to be kicking off very soon. We've got some new names coming into the fold. We've got the Super Series coming up, which is going to be featuring uh, AAA, uh, Dragon Gate, and I can't believe... Uh, what else there? Um, can we raid Quest for Jewels, Mike? The ref, you goddamn right. We can re- we can go over to there. I will take care of that in a moment here as we come to an end of the show. Uh, I'm not quick at it, but I will make it happen, my friend, um, because I I trust you and I know you know Quest for Jewels is a great channel. Um, but yeah, that's I overall, man. I had a hell of a time watching this MLW Fusion episode. I thought it was top notch. This is exactly what makes me an MLW fan. And you know what makes me a fan of pro wrestling? It's seeing those damn numbers that we retained all night. Thank you to everyone. God damn, this has been the best night ever. Awesome, awesome, awesome. 28 views, and that number has not really been dropping this whole time. One hour and a half out of your Thursday night. Man, I love every single one of you. Ole to each of you. Fantastic. Uh, Papa Smokes, your thoughts overall on the episode before we say our goodbyes and head on over to go and raid the channel of Quest for Jewels. Well, the MLW episode was was quite enjoyable and a good one. And I also enjoyed doing this episode, the two-parter with a little talk about Judo Jean LaBelle and then also a MLW fusioned episode of doing our reviews here. It's great to be back. It's great to be on our own two feet again. And uh, this is good stuff. I'm pumped for the future. Going to keep the nose to the grindstone working all these Thursday evenings, doing prep getting ready, getting the headphones on and talking some wrestling. Thanks to everybody and all our friends that watch this. We appreciate this so much. Thanks. Yeah. Means the absolute world because we can't do it without you guys. Uh, you're, you're, you're helping us get to the moon and we're going to do the same for each and every single one of you, our good friends that continue to push us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Papa smokes. That's going to bring a wrap to the very first episode, but my man, I got to ask you, where can the people find you? Where can they reach out to you outside of right here on the Video Bros Network? Well, if you're a contributor to Elon Musk's free speech wonderland known as Twitter, I am at smokes underscore papa. And if you want to check me out on Twitch, I'm at papa underscore smokes underscore. Yes, and if you want to catch me, you can find me at Real Bobby Munson because if you want to know the true story, the fake Bobby Munson was in Sentence of Anarchy, and I've got the goddamn ID that proves that I'm the real deal right over here. So you can catch me there on the socials. Uh, you can catch us on Instagram at Video Bros SK, and again, you can catch us Prairie Pro Wrestling every Saturday with new match releases each and every Saturday on the channel there. It is a fantastic time. Thank you, every single one of you, for tuning in to the first ever live edition of Ring Respect Radio and the first ever edition of Fusion right here on the Video Bros Network. Uh, We are going to give a little outro and then we're going to head on over to Raid Quest for Jewels. Thank you everyone for tuning in and have a wonderful night. We will see you Sunday for Busted Out and next Thursday for more Video Bros. I made this shit last Burning down to the wake up Go to the sun Go slow to make it down